Well, good afternoon and welcome everybody to the post Labor Day, September 8th bull session. I believe this is our, our 10th session of these that we've been doing where we basically grab a couple topics of potential interest and uh, dig into them. And uh, we'll keep doing these as long as it seems to make sense to do them. And Ken, I did uh, reach out into the world of of magazine covers and find another bull cover on the left there. <laughs> There's no shortage of these, and you're going to see why that's an important thing in a minute. And, of course, we are going to talk about Serena Williams, because why not? It's the U.S. Open. Um, I've been watching a little bit of the U.S. Open. It's kind of strange without anybody in the stands, but Serena did win in advance. She's still going. Well, I believe there's a field of eight ladies left, and she's uh, still cruising along. The other reason that Serena is with us, well, she's not with us. We're just going to discuss Serena, but uh, she's she's from Ken's neighborhood. She was actually born and spent the first few years of her life in Saginaw, Michigan. I, I don't think she ever made it up to the point where she became one of your students, right, Ken? No, I don't think so, Mark, but her and Madonna up in Saginaw there. So, Well, no, Madonna was from my place. Madonna actually no. grew up about a block from where I live now. She might have grown up there, but she was born in Saginaw, Michigan. So. She was, really? Madonna? Yes, she was. Uh -huh. yeah. Well, Natalie says that the Bay City claims her also. So it's somewhere between Bay City and Saginaw, which, you know, is... is is city versus city right there. So kind of blurry. Okay. And then we're going to close out yeah. with uh, Ralph Acampora and just a, a brief discussion of investing in the S and P 500 as an index fund and what that might entail. But let's see where this kind of stuff takes us. All right. You guys all know the disclaimer. I see a lot of familiar names, but if you are here for the first time, a huge welcome to you, but no investment recommendation is intended. This is all about education. It's about demonstrating and illustrating the philosophies and methods of the modern investment club movement as uh, interpreted by Manifest Investing and certainly inspired by the National Association of Investors for almost 80 years and better investing. Uh, all opinions are our own. We will disclose if we will at least attempt to disclose if we own a stock that's being talked about. We do run a monthly webcast on the final Tuesday of every month. It's 8.30 Eastern time, and uh, everybody's invited. It's free. If you'd like to be added to the reminder list, the email address that you need to know is nkavula1 at comcast.net. If you have any follow-up uh, stuff you want to talk about with us, send me an email, markr at manifestinvesting.com. All right, just as a quick Mark, we have Howard in the audience. Uh, before we get away from it, could you or Kim tell uh, tell Howard the name of the small cap book and the author that you were referring to right as we started the broadcast? Sure, and in fact, we'll probably add it to the bullet list right here. Nice segue, Howard. Um, it's called The Small Cap Advantage. The subtitle is How Top Endowments and Foundations Turn Small Cap, well, excuse me, Small Stocks into Big Returns. The name is Brian T. Barris, B-A-R-E-S. And uh, he runs a, a hedge fund. He's been doing it for, I don't know, Kim, are you, are you live on here now, 20 to 30 years or so? I think it's uh, 12 to 13. Okay, a little bit less. He comes, yeah. he comes out of the Nebraska uh, farm system, went to school in, at Lincoln at the University of Nebraska, so he's one of those guys. But uh, quite a track record, and we're going to be airing out some stuff about Brian Shortly, I will post in the on the thread on the Manifest Investing Forum picture of the book and a brief description, and uh, I think a few of us will be reading that book over the next several days. So again, the book is the Small Cap Advantage. The author and he's a hedge fund manager that specializes in small companies. Obviously, that rhymes with the stuff that we do in September and October, as we do our small or our best small company discovery at this time of year. And his name is Brian Barris, B-A-R-E-S. And Mark, I want to add so people are aware, if you uh, search that name in YouTube, um, he just, uh, I found his, I found out about this guy by listening to the Acquirers Multiple podcast, 
with Tobias Carlisle and Brian was on it and this was no more than two or three weeks ago but uh, he also has a YouTube video out there from I believe it's Tech Texas Tech University and that was really uh, another one that I thought was pretty good. So there are a couple of YouTube videos out there if people want to watch those. So again in the spirit of him having a decent track record and uh, seemingly a a skill at identifying some of these smaller companies. We'll take a look at his track record and also um, be mindful of the type of stuff he's interested in as a potential opportunity for uh, study. Any comments or question on any of these? We're going to go some of these places here in the next few weeks. We do want to talk about banks sometime fairly soon. All right. We're good to go, Ken. I think so, Mark. All right. I just wanted to throw up and display the quotes from this week that are in the, the weekly updated manifest. And it's the, part of the inspiration behind uh, the S&P 500 stuff that we're going to be talking about. Because Jim Cramer basically thinks that over the long term, a, an individual select carefully selecting common stocks can beat the S&P 500. We've heard that from Hugh. Most of us believe that. We have seen in many investment clubs outperform the market over the long term. And even if you just barely underperform, I think you're still doing a, an incredible service to yourself. And we can talk more about that. Second point, uh, become more humble as the market goes your way. Um, there's a lot of people uh, getting humbled by the market as we speak. You know, all the people that were writing some stocks up like rockets and they were they were geniuses. There's a... There's a whole lot of, it's like a, a whole herd of cats lined up and getting their tail stepped on at Robin Hood um, with the stuff that's been going on in the market. It, it makes them uncomfortable. Now, those of us here know better, and we just simply smile and nod and go shopping for stocks to buy. But uh, it is painful, especially if it's uh, your first time through it, or it's always painful when, when uh, stock prices drop especially when they drop as much as some of them have in the last few days. In the Joel Greenblatt quote, of course, uh, we believe that doing the type of analysis that we do on individual stocks means that we're not idiots. Uh, it doesn't mean that we pretend that we can predict the future, but we do think we can stack the probability deck in our favor more often than not with the rule of five. And I quoted myself at the last one. I, I like that one. I think Casting that, casting that vision of success is one of the most powerful things that we do. And that's really what these sessions are all about. All right. Do you want to argue with any of those, Ken or Kim? I don't want to argue, Mark, but uh, I got my first thank you note as an old man today. Oh, no. Uh, my uh, grandson is a chemistry major at, at Eastern Michigan University, and his uh, roommate is a finance major. Uh, his roommate is also a workaholic and is also quite an investor. Put together a, a quite a sizable portfolio for a 21-year-old uh, young man. And uh, I got the email today that said, thank you, Mr. Kabula, uh, <laughs> for, for opening my eyes about overvalued stocks. Uh, I sold my Tesla three weeks ago. So... Uh, He's a he's a very happy camper this morning as Tesla falls, uh, what something like twenty some odd percent this morning. So, yeah, absolutely. In fact, if you look at the the, the projected return on value for Tesla, it did approach zero, and uh, I would expect it to fall to some point where that was that would be restored to three or four, maybe five percent at some point. Good stuff. All right. <clears throat> So who says uh, time doesn't plagiarize itself and have covers repeat? Because the cover there on the left we talked about last week or two weeks ago, I forget, but recently we talked about it, and that's from 1982. And I, I don't know if you guys can make out the the year on the one on the right. So that's 89? a 58? 1958. What a, what a golden period, huh? <laughs> Yes, it was golden. That's when I was born. Hey, me too. Me too. And notice that, you know, this deal, that's why I talked about in the intro to this session or the bull, or the, the thumbnail, 
uh, this is not our first recession rodeo here at Bull Sessions. And uh, notice that they seem to be pretty focused on the recession back in 1958. And here's what it looked like back then. This is actually from the St. Louis Fed, known as FRED. And you're looking at a two-year chart of the Dow Jones Industrial Average, and uh, the magazine came out somewhere in this time frame. So again, we're looking at a few months of downward motion in the market. Keep in mind that the National Association of Investors was just five or six years old at the time to give it even more context. But as Kim just pointed out, uh, she and I were born back in that time frame that that cover came around. But yeah, they got the American people were becoming fatigued with the recession. And sure enough, anytime one of these covers comes out, and we'll probably spend a whole session on on bull covers, especially bull covers that are in duress. And uh, I would say April 1958 through the end of 1958, uh, this, this, I was born somewhere right in here. Landmark. That's a whopping, a whopping 150 point gain from low to high there, Mark. <laughs> yeah, and the other thing that's kind of cool is the, the market is down, at least it was an hour ago, 450 points today. And that's <laughs> that lines up with the 450 on the chart. We gotta we have to show the talking heads on television charts like this to get them to understand percentage gain rather than point gain. You know? Oh, absolutely! It makes me wild when I hear it. All right, this one's for you, Ken. This is our, this is our Where's Waldo? Because we want to put 1958 in context. This is one of Ken's favorite charts. Take it away, Ken. I, I I love this chart. Uh, this is the bell curve, and it it shows what the I think this one measures the S and P 500. Uh, shows what the S and P 500 has done uh, every year uh, since well it, since close to the SEC uh, starting uh, something some, somewhere around 41, 42. Yeah, I think I, I see a 41 on there. So yeah. there's the 41. Yeah, but uh, it. It shows how how nice a bell curve is, and it shows how that that 10, 11 percent, depending on how you measure it, is really the the most common return, the average return, if you will, uh, for the stock market over the last uh, at least 80 years. And I think that return actually can can go maybe into the 100, 120 year uh, range and still be pretty valid. Uh, have we added 2000? We have added 2019 to the chart. Great. So there it is up there. So uh, it's it's just a, a great chart. And, and when you start looking at three-year time periods or five-year time periods and graphing them in the same manner, uh, you become really surprised at the number of negatives that exist. Uh, because by the time you get to a five-year time period and look for a negative over the, the last five years to graph, uh, you find that there's only one or two five-year periods in all of that 80-year history where we, we have a negative number. Uh, and it's not a really big negative either. It's a small negative. Uh, so, you know, I, I've done huge presentations on two words, patience and discipline. Uh, and I think this chart points to both of them. Be patient, be disciplined, and the odds are stacked in your favor for gains in the stock market. Oh, yeah, you could go with this too shall pass whenever you get one of these out here and all, all things like that. But we do like to point out that in addition to Mark and Kim being born, uh, 1958 ranks as one of the best years post-1940. I choose 1940. Be, uh, I look at the stock market post-1940 because that's when the Investment Company Act went into place. Basically, the final, ver the final creation of the SEC, right, Mark? Yeah, the SEC in the 19, early 1930s, but they, a number of regulatory reforms were put into place that culminated in the Investment Company Act back in 1940 or 1941. So the premise is the stock market uh, post-1940 is a different beast. Uh, I really. Well, oh, I thought you were just trying to guess when I was born. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you on the chart? 
You're on the chart. I'm on the, I'm on the chart. Yes. <laughs> okay, we'll, we'll leave it at that for now, unless you want to, unless you really want to open up the kimono. Well, no, we'll we'll leave it at that for now. Okay. okay. So anyhow, 1950 it was pretty cool. So the moral of the story is, when you see a bull on the cover, especially a a bull in distress, go shopping. Yeah, that, that that has just been a pretty good idea over time. All right, here's Serena. I don't know if she plays today or not. Good, pretty good uh, chance that she does. But the reason that she comes up is that U.S. Open, the U.S. Open, the, the tennis championship in the United States, has partnered with Zoom, a company that many of you wanted to talk about recently. And they're actually, Roxy, Roxy must like Serena. <laughs> trying to, trying to reach her right here, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, mute myself so you can. She's okay. All right, so they've partnered with Zoom and they're doing a bunch of VIP stuff and and doing some um, cyber type, you know, the type of types of things that Zoom does. But I was also kind of fascinated that one of her most recent tweets involves investing. Talks about an, an credit her as an accredited investor and a venture capitalist, so that's kind of cool. Plus, she's from Saginaw and could have been a student of Ken Kabula at some point. Have you guys heard that The Rock is partnered with somebody called the Acorn Group? That how you can start? He said he says he started off with seven dollars, and how you can begin investing with seven dollars, and it's it's something the Acorn. That, hmm, that sounds me really familiar. Yeah, that's something we can talk about when we talk about Graham Stephan here in a few minutes. All right, so Zoom, this is kind of the question that we were kicking around, at least conceptually, last week. Our lives have changed. Uh, Zoom got really, really popular about four, four to six months ago, and I would argue that it's less popular than it used to be um just as an example my wife is responsible for the employee engagement stuff at chrysler corporation and uh she had hundreds of attendees and she put on she put on i mean i'm biased but she put on these fantastic programs and the the attendance has dwindled and i don't know about you guys but i'm not doing as many zoom calls um and I just think that's kind of a, a trend that's in place. Having said that, the this notion of remote resources and technology, that's not going to go away. Um, I just think some of the early adrenaline burst that came a few months ago seems to be subsiding a bit. And it's carrying with it tectonic uh, shifts in the commercial real estate and everything else out there. So this is kind of the area that we wanted to take a quick look at. I'm uh, looking, Mark, at, at companies that are incorporating their uh, meeting uh, software, their what, whatever they're using to meet face-to-face -face, uh, and everything. Uh, I'm presenting one tonight at, at my investment club called uh, E-Plus. I don't know if you've ever heard of it before, but they do all kinds of, of uh, support uh, for computer users, they do security, they do networking, and, and many, many different types of things. But among all those things are integrated programs that tie together the entire uh, uh, information tech part of your business and makes it available to users uh, on their uh, platforms to speak to each other about uh, and it seems that as I talk to more and more people in business, that an informal uh, product like Zoom is kind of being pushed out in favor of a product that allows access to a lot more information that the company or the organization might have. Uh, my granddaughters, who are both at the same university north of us here, uh, are using a system that's tied directly to uh, all of the systems at Saginaw Valley so that they're all integrated with each other so that when they make references, they, they have uh, embedded links so you can go from one place to another place to another place uh, without having to create those, those links or get through the firewalls. Uh, 
if you've gotten into their meeting, you know, their, their classroom meeting space, then you've gotten through their firewalls already. So it's, uh, it's just a very interesting uh, section. We talked a little bit last month uh, about companies that, you know, commercial companies that were there. And I think if we do a little bit of digging, we're going to find that, that the uh, competition for meeting uh, software and for product is really going to be heavy uh, as we move forward. Yeah. And Zoom, which is really a pretty simple product, I, I'm i not so sure is is up to the task of meeting that kind of competition. I would agree with that. In fact, we'll show a list here in a minute that of companies that are, are credible threats to what's going on. Here's a look at the stock price chart for Zoom. I think it shows the euphoria, and it shows the reaction to that wonderful revenue and earnings report that they made just a few days ago. You can also see that the relative uh, strength index actually topped 90. And uh, that's generally, a, you might want to think about selling that situation for many of us, uh, especially considering some of the stuff that Ken just said. I'm, uh, I'm reminded of the warning of some of the founders about single product companies. These guys are really good. I mean, there's no question. They've been a trailblazer. Um, they have actually forced companies to make other adjustments. They've made adjustments to some of their security protocols and stuff like that that's inspired similar efforts at other companies. So these guys are are really firing on all cylinders, but it, it's going to be intensely competitive. There, there can be no doubt. Here's a quick look at a visual analysis, business model analysis, using the, the most recent report that, that's actually in the current edition of value line and the one from three months ago and you can see the major step change that has happened uh, these guys caught fire and really benefited from the pandemic and you can just see that there's a number of numbers a number of the data points the key data points along the way look at this one uh, basically profitability uh, shifting into overdrive at this company and uh Again, the projected return, low single digits, so probably would put everybody's attention at these. Again, when it was up around 478, uh, that projected return on value probably approached zero. And uh, they don't have any debt, but notice notice how, you know, we have talked about how Value Line really can struggle with attaching a number to a company. I don't remember. It might have been 1999, the last time I saw one of these. The low price forecast for the three to five year time horizon back in June was 150. That three to five year uh, time horizon low price forecast in just three months was ratcheted up to 545. And that that's just, uh, I think that qualifies as a whipsaw, don't you think so, Ken? Oh, absolutely. and and. While I appreciate the attempt to to come up with trends and everything, I'm I'm always really leery of trends that are based on two or three data points, and and these trends can be whipsawed around real simply by one really bad uh, quarter or or one really really good quarter. Uh, and right now, I'm not sure that that any of this uh, has truth. I'd much rather. Uh, look at that proved number and say to myself, that's a, a number right now that makes more sense to me than any number that I can pull off of a, an SSG, whether it's based on cash flow or on earnings per share, whatever it's based on, uh, you know, whether or PE for that matter. Uh, so uh, it, it's it's speculation in in my mind it's it's, mm -hmm. it's pure utter speculation and uh and i just keep coming back to that thing that i have said so many times in so many different uh webinars that uh i bought commodore stock uh in the 70s because it was sure to be the greatest computer company in the world uh and I don't doubt if many of our younger uh, listeners even heard of Commodore before, <laughs> let alone understood that it was a publicly traded company. Well, I, I remember Compaq even. Well, that Compaq was kind of taking things over. 
That was after Commodore, yeah. Yeah. So here's a quick look. This kind of goes to the thing you mentioned a few minutes ago, Ken. Zoom is, they have done, it's undeniable. I mean, they have a 36% market share, according to this data source. So that's not Gartner, but uh, everything I looked over seemed uh, pr pretty good information. And uh, just look at some of the, just look at the comparison with the market share numbers that you see. There's about 100 competing uh, companies involved in this type of technology from GoToWebinar to WebEx uh, on 24. I think the company you mentioned might have actually been buried down lower on this list, Ken. But you see Google and Microsoft showing up here. Um, I don't think these two companies are going to stay down there. That's just a guess. Um, Slack isn't even listed on the, the list, so they must see Slack as something different. But garnering a 36% market share is pretty phenomenal. And we've, we've relied on GoToWebinar for quite some time. And again, you can find uh, 100 names of companies that are in that area. One of the things that you will encounter, we talked about Blackboard briefly. That's a private company out of Washington, D.C. Um, certainly quite formidable. Seems to be probably better leveraged in some of the educational systems. Um, Ken made reference to that last week, and then I also wanted to point out that well, it's also it's also established, Mark. It's been around uh, yeah. since before COVID, so that uh, universities, especially, are very familiar with Blackboard. So are a lot of K twelve systems. They're very familiar with it. It's a it's an easy product, and you know as well as I do that once you get kids used to a particular piece of software, uh, it stays with them for a long, long time. Uh, that's been Google's uh, uh, attempt to move into the K-12 market for oh half dozen years now with uh, Chromebooks and with Google Docs and everything else. Uh, they'd like to turn us away from using Windows products and Microsoft products into using Google products. And the way they're going to do that is to educate the kids. Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised to see somebody like Google, you know, as part of a strategy, you know, taking on a Blackboard or a, a similar company, especially if they've got good shelf space representation in the educational systems. So, yeah, that that's all valid stuff. The other thing that I, I had just become aware of fairly recently, there's August 31st on the date there, a go-to webinar is no longer a publicly traded company. Uh, with the with the uh, the fact that log me in has been taken private as of just a week ago, so you can't actually invest publicly into uh, go to webinar anymore. I did throw together a a quick. This is really quick and dirty, and we can add companies if people want to. But uh, these were the six most commonly mentioned, and there's six at the top of the chart. This one's obviously going away shortly, but you know, Zoom is basically up against the, the names on that list. And uh, uh, that's not an easy fight. And uh, Ken kept using the word no moat in, in recent conversations about Zoom and some other companies, but especially Zoom. And uh, I, I noticed that Morningstar referred to them as no moat several times in their most recent analyst report. And uh, Again, I think this comes back to this notion of very few barriers to entry in this area, and also this notion of everybody else on this page besides them has a whole lot of other businesses and different uh, venture opportunities and that sort of thing, whereas these guys are kind of one-dimensional, and that can be dangerous to an investor. Now, I'm not saying it's the end of the world, but I'm saying when you go into a, investing in a single product company, I mean, I'll even say like Amazon, M, excuse me, Amgen 20 years ago as a single product company was more vulnerable to a problem than the, the current day version, which has multiple product lines. Any other comments on that, Ken? Uh, no, I, I think that everything you've said and everything I said uh should make people a little bit wary of, of Zoom video at the moment, especially at the current price. Now, I know that, uh, I, I don't know, how recent is this price? Last Friday's, Mark? That would be last Friday's. And, I mean, it's, yeah. in, it's in the middle of an update, so 
uh, some of these numbers will change a bit. That one will go up a little bit. Uh, the price actually went up to 478, and now it's back down to 370. I think I saw that it was down another 10 or 15 dollars today. It's down a little bit today, not down as dramatically as Tesla or mm. some of the other uh, companies, but it's down two, three percent again today. Yeah. But just like Ken was saying, I, I I ran into a number of companies. So there's a a company touted on Morning Brew today that did all the stuff Ken was just talking about of of basically pulling together not just your your technologies for the conferencing, but the total enterprise stuff. Um, in a way that hasn't been done by many companies uh, for some time. So again, I think that will just uh, encourage innovation and, and better ideas in the realm of big data and all that other stuff. All right. Any other comments on that? Well, I'm getting, uh, somebody wants to know the ticker for E plus, it's PLUS. Uh, that's the company I'm presenting. Uh, I don't think it happens to be the best, even it's even in its own industry. That's just the stock that was assigned to me. But uh, it certainly is an interesting stock, uh, and I think you want to take a look at it, uh, probably uh, along with some of its competitors. And uh, it seems that that there are a number of competitors that are making the effort to integrate the entire, uh, as Mark said, enterprise system rather than just the, the meeting part of the, the system. So, okay. Len is telling us that Zoom is at 354 right now. Yeah, I think that's fairly consistent with what's going on with the technology of stocks in general. All right, so let's go ahead and move on to this one. Shifting gears here. Um, I don't know. Is Hugh in the in the room or not? I not yet, Mark. Okay. He warned me that he may not be available today. Hugh McManus actually brought this young man. I think. Can, am I at the age yet, Ken, where I can refer to a thirty-year-old as a young man? Yes, you are, Mark. <laughs> okay. So he is a young man. His name is Graham Stephan, as you can see there on the slide. And Hugh has been watching him carefully for the last uh, couple of months. He's a uh, uh, very active YouTuber. He's known as an influencer. His basic storyline is that he became a real estate agent at the age of 18 in Los Angeles, uh, became a millionaire by the age of 26. And uh, he's been posting on investing and managing real estate. He has seven rental properties in Los Angeles. And he's been doing a number of things. I'll save the rest of the story for, for Hugh McManus at some point in the future. Uh, I find him charismatic and, and kind of cool. Um, he taught me about like buttons and algorithms at YouTube. That's he's always encouraging people to destroy or crush the like button. We'd like for you to do that at our uh, on our YouTube channel too. But uh, he's obviously piling up some pretty strong following. And he uh, his advice to investors again, considering himself to be a beginner. Uh, he's making a fair amount of money on real estate and YouTube, um, and he's investing that predominantly into the into the S and P 500. So I would encourage people to Google him or go to YouTube and search. And he has some interesting sessions. Kim was mentioning um, Acorns with The Rock, and uh, he, uh, Graham put out a. The videos are pretty cool. They're only 12 or 14. In some cases, they get to be 16 or 20 minutes, but most of them are, are closer to 12. A year ago, he put out a, a session on the best investing apps for newcomers. And uh, in our work with relative newcomers, you know, millennials who really want to be investors, we knew about Robinhood, but we didn't know about M1, M1 out of Chicago. And they, they appear to be, actually have been ahead in terms of the resources and tools for investors. Um, Robin Hood is catching up and, and putting some of the things in, in place that M1 has done for quite some time. Uh, Graham also pushes Webull, W-E-B-U-L-L. -L. And in fact, in the literature that you can see there, if you do show more, um, Webull offers two free stocks. To somebody who opens up an account for $100. So that might be kind of interesting. Um, Ken, I'm hearing that uh, one of the stocks they most commonly give away is Ford. 
<laughs> that might that might have something to do because they talk about it. It could be a stock from like close to ten, approximately ten dollars, up to fourteen hundred dollars. I think Ford's on the low end of that scale. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> so I, I'm I'm tempted to open up an account just to see what two stocks I get. In fact, I'm I'm committing right now. I'm going to do that because Graham keeps telling me to do it. Um, but he is a lot of fun. But he does he does basically talk about this notion of passively investing in the S&P 500. So I, I wanted to take just a little bit closer look at it and kind of see what I think about it. And this this is my S&P 500 moment. It's uh, Ralph Acampora, the technical guy, but he's a closet fundamental investor. He thinks about fundamental investing and he's famous as being one of the uh, visionary technicians for technical analysis. But he was one of our keynote speakers back at the the Better Investing National Convention back in 2001. And again, to date stamp it, this was just a few weeks after the terrible moments in, in New York back in September 2001. Um, but Ralph showed up, even though it was just a few weeks after that. And uh, he basically issued the warning that you see described there that, you know, we'd been on quite a run in the stock market. For those of you that, you know, think back to before, before the towers went down and the 10 years preceding that, it's a pretty good time for investors in the stock market and especially the S&P 500, although we're going to kind of tear that myth down a little bit. But this notion of buying an index fund, no matter what, almost ranks up there in Ralph's mind, and I'm paraphrasing here, with the, the nifty 50 thinking back in the 1970s, where basically you had all those, the 50 stocks that can, Nothing could ever go wrong with, oh, I don't know, companies like Polaroid and Eastman Kodak. You know, what could possibly go wrong? And uh, you buy them at any price and hang on to them forever. It was that type of thinking. And so he's kind of he's kind of tickling at that here. But he stood in front of us, again, 400 or 500 long-term investors. And he says, I'm preaching to the choir here. But his warning because again, this is back in the days of Vanguard and Jack Bogle and you know, just buy an index fund. I think it's a good idea for, for most people, but I don't think it's always uh, a slam dunk truth. And Ralph went so far to say that he thought that anybody investing in the S&P 500 back around the 2001 timeframe, in his words, is about to get killed. Now, I think we have to apply a New York filter to that, and I'll show you why here in a minute. Uh, getting killed, you know, by his definition might be different than ours, but um, let's see what it looks like. So what you see here is the Wilshire 5000 from uh, 1985 up to through 2005, and the purpose that's on the slide is to capture that period leading up to the speech by Ralph. And you can see it had been quite a run for the, the whole total stock market. And for the years 1990 to 2000, you're going to see why in a minute, while we talk about time in the market, you know, versus timing the market, something that Graham is very strong about. Uh, something that all of us believe also, time in the market being much more important than market timing. But uh, also in good hands. And we'll show you why we're using that uh, nomenclature. Notice that the S&P 500 during that 10-year period actually had about an 18% annualized return, you know, beating the Wilshire 5000 by a few percentage points. I'm going to try to make the case for we're basically going through another one of those moments right now. And then just for comparison purposes, you know, how did some other funds do during that same time frame? Well, here's Berkshire Hathaway. And again, I'm not saying for even a heartbeat that everybody can be a Warren Buffett. But the fact is that Berkshire Hathaway, for those who invested in it from 1990 through 1999, saw these types of returns and certainly market beating. Uh, the NASDAQ also did very well. The days just ahead for the NASDAQ were actually pretty dark. We'll talk about that. Mears and Powers is a regional fund out of Minneapolis that proves that you can identify excellent companies in your own backyard when they're on sale. Companies like 3M and uh, ConAgra and just a number of Minnesota-based companies dominate Mears and Powers growth, and they are still able to generate the return that you see there. Uh, we've talked a lot about Brown Small Company that was actually born in the middle of that period, but you can see that they 
they started well out of the gate and you can see the Vanguard Windsor Fund is the only one on this list that actually slightly underperformed the market and nobody's too upset with those 13% gains. So again, this documents that period of performance from 1990 to 2000, you know, in the days leading up to Ralph's speech and showing that the S&P 500 actually delivered an 18% annualized return back in that time frame. Any thoughts or questions on that, Ken? Uh, Mark, what are you comparing Brown Small Company to? What's the benchmark for Brown Small Company? It's the, I noticed the number's different. Yeah, it's the same benchmark. It's the Wilshire 5000, but a different period of time. Because Brown Small Company wasn't in existence the entire time. Gotcha. Right. So it's just a different time frame. There's a lesson right there. I mean, the time that Brown was actually in existence from 92 through 99, 18% on the Wilshire 5000 for that time frame. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So again, the, the case is this was a this was a golden era for a lot of us. Investment clubs it exploded. We actually reached a total population at Better Investing at the end of that period of about four hundred fifty thousand uh, members. Uh, it was definitely a, a golden age period. I used to teach classes in Chicago where I would show up and there'd be one hundred fifty people showing up for a, a class on stock analysis. And there'd be 25 people on a waiting list out in the lobby wanting to get in. Um, so everybody remembers those days. That's the type of time frame that it was. That was followed by this time frame. What you're looking at here is the S&P 500 for the next 10 years. By the way, Ken, you talk about the lost decade a lot. This is one of the better slides I've seen in showing the actual lost decade. Um, the Vanguard 500 Trust, which is just the S&P 500. Um, actually lost ground from 2000 through 2010. And that's what you're seeing here. The actual annualized return is down. So that's why I think Ralph was sort of right. I don't know if that's the definition of getting killed, you know, for a long-term investor, but it's it's definitely uh, not pleasant to go through a 10 year period. Well, here. And, and we have to understand, Mark, that none of this uh, takes into account inflation. So uh, we're, I know that today we're, we're used to inflation at, at, you know, a half a percent, one and a half percent, two percent, that kind of stuff. But inflation was something meaningful back in the uh, 90s and even early 2000s. So that when you, when you kind of fold inflation into this lost decade, uh, you actually were losing, if you were retired, uh, losing a significant piece of uh, of your nest egg, uh, and it was just evaporating. It wasn't being lost because of bad stock picking. It was being lost because of this insistence that the S and P 500 could never lose. Yeah, and, and in fact, uh, I mean, so you had the S and P 500 coming into this red hot, um, and actually have struggling for the next ten years. You can see that the Wilshire 5000 actually checked in at a slightly negative number. That's the benchmark. But there were exceptions. And again, those exceptions are some fairly common names. And again, you know, uh, Graham Stephan goes through and talks about how 99% of professional investors and most investors don't beat the market. And I, I understand that. I understand where he's coming from. Again, uh, the point that we want to try to make as we roll through some of these slides is I think it is possible to identify excellence in investing. And actually, we we do find a way to keep track of these guys over time and uh, unveil those opportunities. Notice that the NASDAQ really suffered uh, during that time frame coming off that, that huge high that it had. So, yeah, just backing up what Ken had to say, you can subtract – another two to three percent from those numbers to account for inflation if you want to talk about real returns and that's that's being extremely kind to it two to three percent i oh, think yeah. oh yeah yeah but it did beat the 1970s so here yeah. <laughs> here we're looking at the same thing only and i want you to remember back in back in this time frame back at the start of that uh lost decade or a few years into it, you know, manifest investing was born right in here. If you go back and read some of the stuff we wrote, we talked about avoiding the S and P 500 stocks. Um, again, just, you know, again, applying the filters and searching for opportunities outside the S and P 500, only going there when the opportunities were, 
were glaring at the time. And then fast forward just a few years, you can go back and read how we said now is the time to go ahead and start getting back into it, back in this time frame. In fact, we may have done a back up the truck presentation sometime in that time frame because, again, it had been in such a lost decade flat spot for so long that Ralph Acampora's warning was no longer true. Um, again, that long-term flat spot, that same type of flat spot that we see with stocks like Home Depot and others that can last for many years. And then they tend to surge pretty well coming out of it. And that was certainly true for Home Depot and others in this time frame. So again, in this time frame from 2010 through 2020, again, we're back to a point not quite as flashy as the 1990s, but that's a pretty good annualized return on the S&P 500. Um, keeping up with the stock market in general. But again, the, the point to be made is the S&P 500 is a subset of the, the whole market. And uh, you really are just focusing in on one piece of that all of the above pie. And we'll talk about the value line arithmetic in a minute. But uh, the last decade has been pretty good for some of these smaller companies and technology companies. Uh, I've thought for many years that the Vanguard U.S. Growth ETF, you know, goes by VUG, has been a pretty good investment for investors. Uh, it certainly made my father quite happy. That was a large holding in his uh, investing efforts. But uh, the point to be made is that the S&P 500 has floated around and it had a, a really strong decade for the last 10 years. And again, Mark, we should stamp the words patience and discipline onto this graph because, uh, you know, there are a couple of other places where where that graph is flat uh, for a significant period of time for, you know, nine months, 12 months. I mean, look at 15, 16 in there. 15, 16 uh, is, is almost perfectly flat for, you know, at least four quarters, maybe five quarters. And then back again in the late 18, early 19 uh, period up there where uh, it's flat to down even. Uh, uh, so so be, in addition to picking the right investment, you need the patience and the discipline uh, to understand what's going on and to stick with it sometimes. Right, and if you had done, um, I'll go back and I didn't have time to prepare for it. This is a subject we're not going to go away from, but I, I believe that the par for the S&P 500 back in this time frame probably was, I'm going to go way out on a limb. I haven't done the math yet, but I'm going to say about 12% for everything in general. It might've been as high as 15. So back in that time frame, uh, we had a pretty strong outlook for the S&P 500. And now you contrast that with, this is more recent history here. Now it's a chronicle from Manifest. Again, looking at the S&P 500. But uh, right now we're basically looking at projected annual returns that are getting down into mid single digits. You know, as opposed to time periods, think back to uh, Christmas 2018 when, when the wheels seemed to be coming off the truck, uh, buying opportunity. March of this year, buying opportunity, the way that we look at the world of investing for the S&P 500, uh, much less so today. I mean, we've gone from uh, returns in the 12 to 13% for the projected returns for the S&P 500 down to mid single digits. So again, kind of in a Ralph Ockham for a moment, I would say that it's not a slam dunk for the S&P 500 under these conditions. Well, and for the folks that have problems uh, with graphs and with numbers, uh, you've circled the buy low, sell high uh, places uh, on the graph, and uh, you've put an arrow by one of the buy high, sell low places on the graph, and you can practically see the other one if you just follow that arrow uh, to the left across the graph sitting right there. Uh, and, and we all know intuitively uh, that you, you need to buy low, uh, and then you need to have the patience to to wait and until it gets higher than where you know uh, before you you decide you're going to do something with it. Um, I, graphs like this uh, for beginners especially I think are are particularly 
interesting, but also necessary as part of your education into how investing works. Uh, I listened to a very bright man on, on uh, one of the shows this morning uh, talk about the fact that, that those of you that are all excited about the last four days uh, forget that this happens every year, and it's happened every year for the last 50 years, that the, hmm. uh, the indexes go down 10 or 12 percent. And those of you that are getting all excited and trying to read something more into it than it is uh, are really taking and spooking a lot of investors. And he kind of scolded uh, the, the people that were asking him questions, asking him to explain why. And he says, there is no why. It's the market just correcting itself for having gotten a little bit too exuberant. That's all that's happening. Yeah, and again, just to reinforce what Ken is saying, this magic moment back towards the end of 2017, stock prices had spiked up rather dramatically, which means that the return forecasts spiked down. And then if you look at this, you know, if you had ignored that and just gone ahead and bought the S&P 500, it, I mean, you could make the argument that it's been uh, a couple of years to actually get back to that price. So I, I, I find that kind of fascinating. Okay, so one last slide, and I think this one captures one of our favorite slides, maybe a little better than I have in the past. I don't know, you, you get to be the judge, Ken, but we talked about Joel Greenblatt, and I'm not for, not again, not even a heartbeat suggesting that, that anybody can and will achieve this type of performance. You certainly can't assume it, but over a 20 year period, his returns were 40% per year turning $10,000 into $8.4 million. And we just simply leave that up there to remind about the incredible power of achieving small in incremental uh, notches of performance. When it comes, you know, small percentage gains make a huge difference. So you can go ahead and set that one aside because it's almost too big to relate to, all right? Just kind of leave that one off. And I want to basically point out that the S&P 500 over that 20-year period from 1985 to 2005, which you see here in this line, the actual dates are there, the numbers are all there if you want to check. We're talking about a 20-year period when the S&P 500 achieved 13% per year. Now, that's a great number. There's, there's nothing wrong with that number. In fact, it's a little high by historical standards. But... Notice that the, the notice how quickly as you add a percent or two going up, climbing up the chart here, how quickly these numbers explode. And I'm with Graham Stephan completely when he talks about, yeah, an S&P 500 investment is generally a pretty good thing, especially if it's uh, going to be the one way to invest regularly and, and get in this and, and be very consistent. But at the same time, there are some opportunities to invest. Now, he confesses he does have some individual stocks off on the side, and I, it'd be kind of interesting to get into that with him someday. So he's got this core of the S&P 500. So maybe he's got like a Nicholson balanced thing going on here with, you know, his S&P 500 for his core or base, which would be entirely consistent with what we do, along with a set of favorite stocks, which by the way, include included Tesla for a while, but he has some others. And uh, just notice the, the small differences in gains. And one of the other reasons I, I like this chart, because it, it basically gives us some, some bullet points of actual achievements for a number of different entities. Um, none of these were a secret. Uh, what I would compare it to, and, and, and Ken, chime in here, if you will. I mean, when you're looking, I'm, I'm thinking of a classroom. And uh, I'm thinking in the, in the mode of most li likely to succeed. I was just looking at my mom and dad's yearbooks from their high school. And uh, they had this category, you know, they attached uh, nicknames to everybody or whatever. But they had this most likely to succeed category. I don't know, as a teacher, Ken, you can, you can kind of spot uh, individuals. They don't always pan out, but fairly consistent and reliable, strong performance. I mean, you've taught some a couple of the leading hedge fund managers on the planet. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, you, you had to notice those guys in the classroom, right? 
You don't have to name names, but well, you know what I'm saying. I, I, I got to be honest, Mark. The, the two uh, billionaires that came through my high school that are on the Forbes list yeah. uh, were, were not stellar students, and they did not uh, show themselves as being exceptional uh, during high school. And part of it, I think, had to do with culture, and part of it had to do with language. Uh, but they certainly turned that around in the 10 years after high school. Uh, but when you're looking me, for. I was just going to well, say that almost makes me wonder if they wouldn't have fit more into the mold of a uh, Elon Musk and how, how massively misunderstood he can be. Well, perhaps, but if you, but if you look at an average group of, uh, of kids, you, you can most of the time identify those that are, are going to end up in the top 15 or 20 percent of of earnings and those that are are probably going to struggle uh for the rest of their lives you can you can pretty well sort them out uh, a little bit uh, as they leave high school but again i i want to make clear there's always room for major exceptions and, oh yeah and the biggest exception are these two billionaires that that uh, came through our little tiny country school uh, and today own things that, uh, you know, just just they can buy and sell the entire school district uh, <laughs> uh, without even uh, with with maybe pocket change. So uh, and and they were wonderful people with wonderful parents and and all the right work ethic. But as far as distinguishing themselves academically or mathematically or intuitively, uh, I would never, ever in a million years have guessed that's what was going to happen to the, either one of them. Well, you're, you're being kind so, of cooperative. So they're the exception that proves yeah. the, the rule, maybe. Uh, I, I wanted to say, though, I'd like for you to identify the next Greenblatt for me and put me in contact with him, and I'll give him most of my money, and we'll see what happens in the next 10 years, okay? <laughs> well, well, part that's part of the thinking here, because... We, we actually think it's possible to do that in some measure. And, you know, it comes down to taking a look at uh, maybe, maybe it could be this Brian Barris that we were, talked about a few minutes ago, small company investing. Certainly something we've witnessed at Brown Small Company over the years from Eddie Brown to the current uh, champion there, Keith Lee. Um, they have an outstanding track record. Even it's gone on to be even uh, – one order of magnitude better than what you see on this slide. But again, going back to the mid 1980s, because this is when I was beginning to have an interest in investing and, and Warren Buffett was not a stranger. And yeah, I understood what Peter Lynch had done. By the way, it's interesting to see what happened with Peter Lynch gone and how far Magellan fell down the chart and ultimately falling farther. John Neff ultimately retired. Uh, but notice Ralph Wanger on there for the Acorn Fund. I know Ken has been a champion of the Acorn Fund over the years. Um, I think it is possible to identify some of these people. Um, maybe not the next Greenblatt, although that's I wouldn't rule that out. But uh, I think it is possible to identify a slight advantage. Again, when we talk in terms of stacking the probabilities in our favor, it's uh, it's something that can be done without an incredible amount of effort to look for people who seem to know what they're doing and then basically map it. And that's what we've done. We will probably spend, I, I strike the word probably, we will spend some time going over a current day version of this list. Um, yeah, what, I, I the, will tell you, Mark, that, that I owned Acorn Fund uh, in the, roughly this time period. And as long as Ralph Wenger was the uh, manager of the fund and he, he was a kind of a one uh, one man operation for that fund things were things went very very smoothly but uh, things deteriorated rapidly after he left that fund and uh, you had to understand how good he really was and you had to get out of that fund uh, if you were going to preserve the kind of returns that we're seeing here uh, so you know you, you have to watch uh, who's who's leading things and who's who's on top of the, the game. Uh, one of our very astute uh, audience members is pointing out that there's a typo in the last line, the last column of the S&P, and that really is missing uh, a, a factor of 10. It should be 115,000 and something, Mark, rather than 11,500. Oh, okay, I must have uh, 
I'll go back and double check that. Yeah, it's uh, it, it 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 definitely should be uh, more than that when you look at the the uh, vanguard right above it. Uh, so it, sh it it definitely should be okay. So I will take a look at that. But but again, the message is is we think we can at least discover these. And in, in terms of you know Graham Stephan, I, I do think that having a, a core investment in the S and P five hundred is a great idea, and investing regularly into that is a great idea. Uh, I just wonder if there isn't a field of opportunity that's just as easily accessible. Um, I've learned a lot just listening to some of this stuff. I, for instance, I had no idea that Fidelity had a total market index that has a zero management fee. We'll talk more about that and some other stuff in the future, but uh, um, some interesting stuff. Again, And I'm going to remind you, Mark, that we're at 3 o'clock. Okay. That's a good time for this slide to come up, which is our picture of the tennis courts at Burt Lake, and I wish I was there. <laughs> That's our grandson on the on the side there, just waiting to get in and and become the next Serena Williams, if if at all possible. All right. So with that, thanks everybody for showing up, and then until next time, we'll go ahead and throw some stuff on the on the wall next Tuesday. I uh, hope this is kind of prodded some thinking and we'll, we'll go shopping for some of those candidates and take a look at some of those small cap managers as we wind down towards September and October's effort with the best small companies. Anything in closing, Ken? Nope, we're pretty well caught up on our question box. So I'd like to thank everybody for coming today uh, and hope to see most of you next Tuesday. All right, well, sorry, thank this is you. Sorry I was late. I was on a bit of a company call. Just tuned in at the end. Okay. Well, we definitely covered Graham Stephan for a bit. I'm going to go ahead and close down the the recording. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week.